Hi folks, this time I'm going to keep the intro a little bit shorter than my previous videos. I will be talking to William Simpson, we have a lot to cover. Uh, we'll dive straight into the mud and the muck and the sediment. Um, that's what he's gonna be talking about. And um, he is a local, so he has been following the dam removal for a long time now. So let's dig right in. Hey William! So, uh, nice to meet you on Zoom here. I guess next time I'll be able to meet you uh, in person. Yeah, so we're all talking about the dam removal and uh, just wanted to see what your take uh, is on that. Well, it is what it is. They Obviously, they let the sediment go down. Um, we know some things today that we didn't know two weeks ago. For instance, we know the... United States Geological Survey did uh, sediment and water sampling uh, over a period of four years from 2018 to 2022. And they did those samples up and down the Klamath Basin. Um, so they do have water and sediment samples for heavy metals from above Copco Lake, upriver from Copco, and downriver from Iron Gate all the way down to, I think, Happy Camp. And uh, <clears throat> so we, we have this record and it was uh, completed in September of 2022 by, again, the United States Department of, or United States Geologic Services, USGS. And so September 22, they completed that study at Menlo Park. And, um, but interestingly, they didn't release that information until a week after KRC let the sediment down the river. So to put that in perspective, uh, they opened up the, uh, the the big tunnel on Iron Gate Dam on January 23rd and started draining all the water and sediment came out. And then a week later, uh, January 31st, the United States Geologic Service released this big report about heavy metal sediments in those uh, and the water and sediments, heavy metals in both the uh, sediments and water. So um, I have to ask a question. Why was that not released immediately after? Why was it held back until after the sediment got dumped by KRRC? So that's one question I have for, um, I mean, that might be a question for the Attorney General of California. Was this intentional uh, cover-up? Uh, because would mm -hmm. there be an outcry from the citizens knowing uh, when you look at that report, the findings weren't um, super alarming. I mean, there's there's definitely heavy metals coming down the river. The river is transporting naturally occurring heavy metals. We're in a geologically rich area, um, so there are quite a few heavy metals in the in this igneous rock here where we live. So you have you know copper and chromium and silver and lead and and all kinds of things, right? Uh, cadmium, um, arsenic. And so that's in the water normally. But in most places, it's below the EPA levels that where it becomes dangerous. So the EPA kind of sets these levels where, hey, you know, this level and, and above is not good. And this level and below is okay. It's probably still not very good over time, but the lower it is, the better, right? Heavy metals we know are not good unless they're in, you know, micrograms for, you know, for like in vitamins. We knew these things were in the river. And, but what everybody keeps like overlooking, and I, and I think KRC uh, prefers to do this, is, the, is to avoid any discussion about the impact of the lakes on settling the, met the heavy metals out of the water. <clears throat> so we have a lot of well-known settled science about settling ponds. The EPA uses them on mining operations. They're required. When you have heavy metals going down some water, if when the velocity keeps everything stirred up, but as soon as they hit a big open area, the velocity slows and the heavier metals and the sediments settle out. Well, that's what was happening at Copco Lake and Iron Gate Lake. The heavy metals that are normally transmitted down the, Cl the uh, Klamath River, settled out for 106 years at Copco, and they settled out for 60 years in Iron Gate, and they're in that clay sediment. So, which is good because it, it those lakes did something very special for the river. And people, 
these people in a big rush to try to get more salmon aren't really considering the science in its entirety because you can't just look at one little piece. This is a very myopic perspective that, hey, we need more salmon at any cost. Well, you may get less salmon because of the way you've done it now. What these lakes did for us was very important. And you have to understand some chemistry and physics. Settling is well known and it's used by the DEQ extensively. So these lakes have been settling out the heavy metals out of the water column. And then so the water coming out of Iron Gate was actually cleaner than the water coming in on multiple levels. OK, so we know the heavy metals in the clay were settling out because they built up in the bottoms of the lakes. There was, you know, tens of millions of metric or cubic yards. Um, and then we also know that we had a lot of nitrates and phosphates coming down from Klamath Lake. Klamath Lake is rich in naturally occurring phosphorus. It's there's a lot of bird poop up there. That's nitrates. So all that comes on down. It goes into solution. It comes on down to the Klamath Agricultural Basin. And of course, those guys are they're using soil amendments because they're growing crops, right? And so that water goes through there and it picks up even more nitrates and phosphates. So when it finally gets down to the lake, then the algae grab that because that's like prime rib for algae. You know, when you got a lot of phosphates and nitrates in water, those blue-green algae, the silbenic, you know, it's microcystis algae, those things, that's just great for them. That makes them bloom and they're happy and they really are getting a lot to eat, but they're taking it out of the water and they incorporate it into their bodies. And then they go down to the bottom of the lake and get covered with clay. So they sequester all of the anthropogenic nitrates and phosphates coming down. So they're doing a job that makes the water coming out of Iron Gate cleaner. So, I mean, people in a rush to get this, they're not thinking about the what was the value of these lakes. What were these lakes doing? Um, they make, of course, clean, uh, the clean hydroelectric power, the obvious stuff, you know, boating, fishing, electrical power, all that. But there's these very, very um, you know, it's ubiquitous, but it's very subtle and not easily observable what's happening with this, the micro, the microbiology in the lake and how it, uh, made that water cleaner. It's very interesting to look at uh, the presentation that KRRC has been socializing for almost two years now. They got a fancy slideshow. They show you these big pictures of how they're going to take out the dams, what's going to happen. Here's our plan, right? The plan. And everybody kind of signed off on it because they weren't paying attention to a lot of the other things. And um, so, okay, fine. But when you look at that, they, they had, okay, so they, the initial dewatering of the dams it started with reducing the water in the dams to the minimum operating level. So what that means is they took the level of the lakes down yeah, about eight feet where I am. So it's basically the level they would take it down to when they anticipate a big snow melt. So the lakes and dams could kind of hold that extra water. So that's what they mean by the minimum. The turbines are still running. So minimum operating level, is that's what that is. But then on the chart that they show everybody, and it's in one of my articles, this fancy little graph, um, they show dewatering the lakes occurring over two months. Okay, but what did they do? They decided at the last minute to go off plan and they dewatered the lakes in three days. Why did they do that? And the only logic, I mean, it's Occam's razor here, when you think about it, the only logical reason is to create a massive torrent of water instead of slowly coming down over two months. They decided that, and knowing that that USGS report was coming out at the end of January, they wanted to get all that sediment down the river as quick as possible. That's, my, that's a theory. So that's what you do. You pop the cork. They opened up all the dams up above, up by Klamath Falls, increased the flow, and they just had a massive torrent. Well, yeah, it carried five to seven million metric yards down, but 70, at least, according to Bransom's math, he said there's 20 million metric yards and we may have sent five to seven million yards down. That means 70, 75% of the sediment's still there and that's the low end. I think there was more than 20 million metric yards. They didn't tell anybody anything. I mean, as you, if you go to the Board of Supervisors meetings, the Board of Supervisors are upset because they want reports on what's going on and they're not getting them for months. When they asked uh, 
they in in the meeting at Copco on February thirteenth, uh, the the chairman, I believe, Mike Kopseff and even uh, Ray Halp asked Mike Mark Bransom, "Hey, you know, we want to we want these tests." You know, he keeps Bransom keeps saying we're testing, and the board said the board of supervisors, our elected officials, say we want to see the tests, and they and Bransom told them right to their face, "I can't let you see them yet. I can't give them to you." And and they go, well, why not? Well, okay. they, and Bransom's excuse, I mean, this guy is slippery. His excuse was, oh, we got to give them to the regulatory agencies first, and then they got to approve them and look at them. And, and then if they're all done with them, then we can get them back and give them to you. Well, that's just great because that creates like a 90-day delay before we even know what, what's happened. I, you know, so... So they let all these sediments down and here we are. Okay. It is what it is. I mean, it's an ecological, total ecological collapse of the river. I mean, from the, from the sediment, the bottom of the gravels and sediments all the way up to the eagles in the sky, the whole thing's collapsed because they wiped out the basic food chain, the microbiome and the, in the river bottom and the gravels, all the microbiome was killed. The, all the small critters that live in there, the invertebrates, um, every fish you know the crawdads i mean the crawdads if you look at just one species the the uh, klamath river crayfish otherwise known as a crawdad those those are a foundational food source for a, a myriad of species and they're all dead they're probably, resilient too yeah probably a billion of them are dead or more and and they fed fish i mean any fisherman knows a, a crayfish a crawdad is great bait for steelhead or salmon you know, that's great bait. And of course, raccoons eat them, the birds eat them, everything eats them. They're all dead. And that's just one of the many, many food sources that have been killed now. So what do we do? It is what it is. Okay. I live on the river at this point. Sure. I would love to have salmon and steelhead swimming past my house, but that's never going to happen as long as this sediment that's right outside my cabin here keeps trickling in the, and the thing is, is this is a, a this is a cocktail of four toxic ingredients to the river. Okay, so clay by itself is highly toxic. Clay is is highly misunderstood. Okay, clay is the smallest particle. Some of the particles of clay are so small you can't see them with a microscope hardly. Then the next largest particle is silt, and then the next largest particle above that is sand, and then gravel. So clay is the tiny, tiny stuff. When you let clay down the river, just clay, if it was only clay that was involved here, that's deadly because it fills the reds, it suffocates, it creates an anoxic bottom of the river because it coats it very effectively. It's and, a, a lid on. Yeah, it puts a lid on it and everything suffocates. It becomes anoxic. And, <clears throat> and because it's sticky, clay is a very unusual particle. It's very sticky. It sticks to the gills, it plugs the gills, it goes into the nose holes of all the little animals, the fish. People don't look at fish very often. The fish have little nose holes. They have all these little places where all this stuff goes in because they're moving, flowing water through their gills. All that clay goes in and it suffocates them. They die, just like the crawdads. The crawdads, you hit them with all that clay, they, get, they, they die. Everything dies. And so just the clay by itself is deadly. Um, it's the worst kind of turbidity you could put in any water body with, with aquatic animals. So that's number one. Number two are the anthropogenic and natural sources of nitrogen and phosphates coming down the river. So if it was just that, just nitrates and phosphates coming down the river, that will cause eutrophication of the river because when you have a lot of dissolved compounds in solution, the water can't hold as much oxygen. So when you have a whole bunch of nitrates and phosphates, it causes eutrophication. Um, and then, of course, we have all the decomposing organic material, the dead algae, dead plants, dead fish, all kinds of stuff in the bottom of the river, or I'm sorry, in the bottom of the lake, that's covered over with clay. So it's sealed in. Clay really seals. In fact, Iron Gate Dam, by the way, is a clay core dam. There's a clay center and it's surrounded by gravel. That's how effective clay is at stopping anything from moving. It blocks the water. Clay stops everything. So uh, you got all this dead stuff that's covered with clay. Well, guess what? When you stir that sediment up, what happens? 
all the organic material comes into the water and then it starts decomposing. That's called an oxidation reduction action or redox. So when you've got decomposing organic material, it pulls oxygen out of the water, causes low dissolved oxygen. So just that alone is a killer. And then, you know, last but not least, we have heavy metals. So heavy metals come down the river. What does that do? Well, all kinds of stuff, because now we're not talking about the normal load of heavy metals that was in the water before the sediment in the bottom of the lake was disturbed. Sediment in the bottom of the lake has highly concentrated levels of what, what is going overhead in the water because it falls out like rain. So now when you look at those heavy metals that we know USGS says are in the water above Topco Lake below in their test, we know it's there. So it fell out into the lakes. It's super concentrated. So when you stir that up, it goes back into the, into the turbid water and it gets carried down. Well, when, when organic, uh, when different uh, bio life forms incorporate those heavy metals into their bodies, it causes all kinds of things. It can cause, you know, immediate death, various kinds of toxicity, irritation um, in humans, you know, and it depends on the heavy metal like lead. Um, we know, we know quite a bit about lead toxicity. Lead is a, a, a pretty uh, serious problem because lead can actually go into solution. And so it can actually move past the alluvium. You know, the river, you've got all the gravel, even in the shore and moving into the land on both sides of the river where people have wells. It's very porous. You know, that's kind of what happened up at the lake or on Copco Lake. You know, the lake was went into the, the alluvium around the lake and it's very porous and they had wells, shallow wells, and they got well water. Well, going all the way down the river, you've got a lot of people with wells pretty close to the, the riverbed. So they're in the, probably in the alluvium. And so these metals can migrate out the part, micro particulates of chromium, cadmium, arsenic, and things can go out and get into those wells. Lead, because it can go into solution, it can actually go farther than that. It can go into wells that are even further, further in and into the, a lot of water table. So lead is particularly problematic. It, fish incorporated heavy metals into their bodies. We know this, okay? including, you know, mercury, cadmium, mm -hmm. chromium, lead, all those things. So if and when, you know, the sediments have coated the whole river, in some places it's 14 inches deep, some of the refugia coming up the river, these big deep holes where, where salmon and steelhead will rest in between their runs up the river, they're filled in with sediment now, and it's toxic. So the refugia is gone. I mean, what do you do to fix that? They're going to probably have to get dredges and go down the river and do some dredging now. Um, to clean that out um, because it'll take decades for the river to move it out on its own because clay packs down hard. It's not like sand. It doesn't move like sand and gravel and silt. So, um, yeah. so anyway, at the very, and at the end of all of it, all these crustaceans and all the filter feeders at the mouth of the Klamath river are going to be concentrating heavy metals into their body. So oysters and shellfish will be concentrating these heavy metals so if you eat those or you eat the fish that are concentrated in it, you could get sick. You might even die. So, this, you know, this is a big problem. So we've got to make these guys come up here and use that standard excavation and remove the sediments that are now exposed, right? The original plan was to dredge them before they dewatered the lake. Back at, Way back in the day when Pacific Corp looked at this, when there was lakes, I think 20 years ago almost, mm -hmm. Their, their people said, you got to dredge all that sediment. You can't let it go down the river. You got to dredge it and take it to the desert. And that's $400 million. Well, they didn't want to do that because they only collected $450 million from ratepayers. So, but now we paid this big ecological price, right? We sent a bunch of crap down the river with the water. And, but now most of the sediment's exposed, which means it's cheaper to go get it. We can use just, you know, front loaders and drag buckets and we can load it up and we can truck it away. But now I see there's videos where these idiots are scooping it up and dumping it right in the river. I mean, they should go to prison for that. They're using our river as a sewer. I saw that today, yeah. I saw that today. Yeah, I mean, these people, they're making money on this. It's smash and grab. They don't care about the future of salmon. They're not acting that way. If they were truly about the fish, they wouldn't let any of these contaminants go down. 
There's just no way. Exactly. No way. It's just, and anybody that buys off on this crap they're trying to sell us about planting a few seeds, you know, they run up here with little potted plants and they put them in the clay and go, oh, look, something grew. You know, they're staging, they're staging photographic ops. Um, you know, yesterday I ran into the LA Times up here and they're driving around with one of the reporters and in a K Klamath renewal vehicle and they're just showing them what they want them to see. They don't show them anything that they don't want them to see, any of the ugliness. Many people that I know from around around the states and the world, and you know, it's the biggest dam removal in the world, and it's just not on the news. Yeah. So yeah, and it's that's a, why I'm. Uh, it's a business. I'm also here. Them. They're gonna. They want to leave here with a A on their report card and go do it somewhere else, and. I don't want them to ruin somebody else's community. I feel sorry for all the people downriver here because now they, they have to go test their wells and they need to do it right away because they need to know if their well is contaminated. It's an if. We don't know. Right. Okay. Well, that's well, not... and over, over, yeah, and over time too. Yeah. And, and who and, knows? Yeah, how even, long, I know like people, forever, that, you know, I know people that can't afford the initial test. <laughs> you know, they, yep. they're on social security. They're poor people. They don't have a lot of money. And then even if you could afford the initial, then how often are you going to test thereafter? Every month, every two months, yep. every year? How much bad water are you going to drink? That's the exactly. Question. Yep. Yeah. Before you get sick, you know, we're going to get sick. Animals are going to get sick. Uh, yeah. So we got to get our county commissioners to issue. They need to declare an emergency. I mean, they have a, they've declared emergencies for marijuana. I mean, marijuana is not good, you know, because it's illegal and some other thing. You know, I mean, I'm not going to get into that whole debate, but the uh, thing is, this is way worse. This is way worse. And if anything needed to be declared an emergency, it's this because we might be able to get some state aid so people can have their wells tested, right? We right. might get state right. agencies to come up here and start testing the water and sediment. The county mm -hmm. supervisors need to do their jobs now. They need to declare an emergency and put it in Governor Newsom's lap and say, look, we got a problem. We believe we have a problem and you need to get some help up here to us. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is we got to make KRRC come up here and pick up all the sediment. They need to clean it up and then they can plant it. But this crap about, oh, we're going to put some seeds on top of the clay and everything's going to be just wonderful. No, it's not. It will continually kill the fish runs and, and weaken them. We already don't have a native run. I mean, you they keep holding out Elwa Dam. Okay, well, when you look at Elwa Dam and what's going on there, okay, their chief biologist, a guy named Brink Brinkman, Washington State, he's the chief fisheries biologist, said, to they're expecting that to restore that river it's only 45 miles long it's a little pipsqueak of a river um they're expecting it to take 25 to 30 years to restore that river and the other thing about that river is only six percent of the run are native fish most of the fish that they're dro dropping in there are hatchery fish so really what it what it really amounts to is it's a very expensive fish farm they're putting hatchery mm. fish in and the other thing that happens is and this is science that anybody can go look it up. When you when you introduce a whole bunch of hybrid fish, the hatchery fish are hybrids. They're not natives, they're hybrids. And when they introduce those in, they're diluting the genetic material of the natives. So the natives are coming up and you get interbreeding. So let's say a, a, a hybrid drops a bunch of eggs, a, a, a female salmon you know, puts her eggs down and then a native could come over and, and and um, fertilize them, right? But what happens is now you've got hybrids. They're not pure native, they're not pure high, they're not patchery, they're somewhere in between because there's so many of them, you know, because if the 6%, as they said, are natives, not everybody else, 94% are hybrids, they're occupying most of the spawning beds. And so over time you get genetic slippage and you have less and less native genetics and you know i grew up around here and i remember in the 60s fishing on the klamath river and these other rivers we never there was no diseases in these fish in the 60s we never heard of these diseases they're talking about now well what's happened since then is they've had this genetic um uh bottlenecking they're using more and more hybrids into the rivers 
you're getting genetic dilution away from the pure natives that were strong. And, and that's mm -hmm. why these other, these hybrid fish are vulnerable to all the diseases. See, the natives have been here for thousands of years and the ones that are alive have developed immunities through natural selection. The ones that are weak die. See, nature kills the weak and the strongest persevere. So our native runs mm -hmm. back in the day, back in the early 60s, they were really strong. They were robust. But because of this dilution and introduction of hybrid fish everywhere, now the native genetics are being diluted and a lot of that immunity to disease is disappearing. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we got to do yeah. things better. All right, well, I appreciate the time today. Yeah, I appreciate your time too. And uh, we'll talk very soon again.